Uh, my name is Tomo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team here at Weaveworks. And hopefully you are here to join our Weave online user group. Uh, if this is your first time, welcome. This is a weekly show that we've been doing on Tuesdays at 10 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, we have Stacy here, who's our community manager, who has lined up these great calendar of events of our own speakers and guest speakers for this series. Uh, today, we have one of our own, Lee Capilli, who's on our developer experience team. We'll be talking about Beyond x86, arm yourself with multi-platform Docker images. So this will be a very exciting talk. Uh, so. Uh, take one minute here in case anybody can see my face moving, but you can't hear us. Please let us know in the chat room if you have any kind of technical difficulties. If not, uh, please bear with us. We'll have a quick little intro of our company. So uh, Lee and I and Stacy, we all work for this company called Weaveworks. If this is the first time you're hearing about us, then welcome. Uh, we're a startup based in San Francisco, London, New York, Colorado. Um, and Berlin, as well as remote teams. I'm starting to forget the number of offices we have. We've been growing this year. Uh, and uh, we've been in the Kubernetes space. And if you've heard of RabbitMQ, our uh, CEO and CTO, the founders uh, come from RabbitMQ. They're the people who created the technology and then sold the company to VMware. Uh, we're a VC funded startup, uh, among them Excel Partners and others. Uh, one of our funders is Google Ventures, which I just call out because it's a core part of our investment in the Kubernetes space. Uh, a lot of our work has been founded on open source. Uh, you might know WeaveNet, which I believe is our oldest open source project that till today uh, still is the, one of the premier ways to network your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we also have a project called Cortex, which has been in the CNCF for a while now, and that is based on Prometheus. So it's built upon Prometheus to make it scalable and extendable, uh, as well as other improvements. Uh, another product, project is Flux, which just recently joined the CNCF as a sandbox project, and that does automated deployments uh, and is kind of what uh, started us on the journey of uh, seeing a certain way of practice that uh, our CEO coined GitOps, which has really taken off. So now we kind of call it the GitOps tool for uh, Kubernetes. Uh, otherwise, we have many other open source projects out there. Um, one of our recent ones uh, that's been around is Weave Flagger, uh, which also builds upon Flux uh, and leverages metrics from Prometheus to do um, things like canary deployments and blue green and all that. So basically you can create automated uh, traffic uh, diverting uh, using service meshes as well as flux and Prometheus metrics. Uh, so some of the, those have been some of the ones that have gotten a lot of attention recently. Uh, we also are a company and we have some paid products. Uh, when we created uh, Weaveworks and then our first product, Weave Cloud, uh, it's a SaaS product for managing your Kubernetes clusters, monitoring and doing automated deployments. Uh, we created that now at this point, close to four years ago. And in some ways it's hosted versions of some of the open source projects that I mentioned now, but of course, highly integrated uh, so that you can make the most of each of those, as well as have it be hosted in the cloud so you don't have to deal with installing and managing those bits. Uh, we've been running that on Kubernetes on AWS now. So we've been, uh, we have uh, Kubernetes in production experience for uh, four years now. So when people came to look at Weave Cloud, they often said, oh, you have all that experience. We'd, we'd love to have additional help with that. So we're in the process now of actually productizing the uh, Kubernetes layer that we created to uh, install Weave Cloud. So now we're calling that Weave Kubernetes platform. And of course, with all the elements of GitOps really taking off, we're making sure that it's a GitOps aware enterprise uh, platform. So if you're interested in any part of your Kubernetes journey, you can definitely come um, ask us about how we do uh, Kubernetes and how we can help, that, help set that up for you. And of course, having had uh, experience of running Kubernetes in production for four years, uh, we do now offer some consulting training and support that's usually around the installation of that Kubernetes platform or in some of your needs with Weave Cloud. So if you have any questions about that, our website is weave.works. So if this is your first time here, welcome. And uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions for you. So as I mentioned, this is our Weave online user group, which we've been running uh, weekly on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. this season. And uh, we have Lee Capilli from our 
uh, developer experience team who is a developer experience engineer or a developer advocate in some ways. Uh, and he'll be talking about multi-platform Docker images. Uh, these are usually about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, they can be as short as 30 minutes. They're usually about 45, including the talk and the uh, Q&A. Uh, if those go longer, we do go a little over, but we have an absolute hard stop at 60 minutes, but these usually hover at about 45 minutes. Uh, if, this, if you've never used Zoom before, this is the platform that we're using. Um, when you ask questions, please use the chat box. You should be able to find the button. If not, sometimes hitting escape helps you get out of uh, full screen mode and you can see more of the functionality from Zoom. Uh, and make sure that when you uh, ask uh, your question or share an answer to somebody else's questions to chat to everyone so that everyone can see your question or answer. Otherwise, we're the only ones who see it. Uh, and you can do that in case you have something highly burning and private. Uh, so uh, with that, oops, sorry about that. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Lee. Today, unfortunately, I have a uh, conflicting uh, meeting, so I will hand it over to Stacy to do the remainder. So she'll be uh, monitoring the chat box and be, be um, referring your questions over to Lee, and we'll do the closeout. So thanks for joining these, and I'll see you guys next time. Please, I'll hand it over to Lee. Thanks, Tamo. <laughs> Just got to grab the presentation. I think you might have to stop. Oh, do I need to stop? stop yeah, I can't steal share. it from you. There you go. I don't have, don't have the powers of vigor. All right, which window do I want to display? Here we are. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much, Tamo. Um, yeah, I'm Lee, uh, DX here at Weave. And I come from like a operations infrastructure background. So uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Uh, that means like managing lots of data centers and uh, lots of virtual machines and things like that. A uh, ton of ops pain, but also from the empathetic position of a software dev, right? So building ops tools in a way that is more software focused, this whole DevOps kind of mindset. Uh, outside of technology, I do a lot of parkour and I am a very, very proud parent of a dog who's about five and a half years old right now. So, yeah. And then uh, I, I spend a lot of time in Kubernetes land. I'm very privileged to work with the people. Uh, I, I feel very fortunate to, to work with Weave as well as all of the other community members in Kube. And um, lots of work going on in SIG Cluster Lifecycle right now. If you want to get involved, uh, just hit me up. I'm, I'm very glad to pair program and uh, help link you up to resources if you want to uh, start making some strides in the community. So, and then Tamo did a great overview of everything that Weave is about. So I, I just all I have to say is that I respect these people so much, and that we make really cool products, uh, and uh, cool we have great open governance projects that have amazing developer experience, which is something I really care about. And so today, talking about going beyond x86, beyond uh, AMD 64 architecture stuff. Uh, really like starting to be able to enable yourself the capabilities of other architectures and platforms, right? And so we have this whole container landscape of tooling. There's networking tools, there's storage tools, we have cluster management, and x86 computers aren't the only thing in the world. Um, now in clouds like Amazon, or if you go with a hosting provider like packet.net, you can even get bare metal hosts uh, you can you can uh, you might you know be at your company and be working on IBM Z power mainframe so those things are super hot I really want one in my house uh, but it costs like hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a single rack for a year or something like that um, <laughs> but there, there's amazing computers of all different kinds of topology they run different chips uh, different you know power outputs and for different purposes uh, some of them have InfiniBand backplane. Some of them are hooked up into GPUs, and some of them have like a thousand cores in a single rack. And um, also, there's a this hot thing coming up on the press uh, called Risk V, which is an open and structure architecture, uh, open instruction set architecture. Uh, so traditionally, companies like IBM and AMD and Intel have um, provided chips. Uh, Intel even licenses AMD technology, right, 
for the uh, AMD 64 architecture uh, in their Intel chips. And um, so this is a very proprietary, you know, kind of corporate governed uh, market. And RISC-V is completely open. You, know, you can go to conferences, you can talk to people, you can read all of the uh, design docs. None of it is like under NDA or anything like that. And we're starting to see hardware show up. So how do we use containers with all these computers? Um, that's like great and all. And I want to start out with some story time. So long time ago in the beginning, which was like 2013 or whatever, these folks showed up at PyCon and then this cute little fishy whale guy came out on stage and his name is Moby. And he was like, just accompanied by a, a pretty small group of pals and they were all French. Right. And so then the music starts playing and it's like, dun, 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 dun. and like everyone's like using containers all over the world and it's starting to get this like really hot thing. And then like a bunch of Googlers are like, Hey, you know, that's actually how we run our infrastructure. And like, we could do some open source stuff with that. And then like Docker's like making all these like world changing things. They're like the Apple of developer experience. Right? They're making these tools that are appealing to everyone. Cultures are changing around companies and the runtime wars are going. And then it's like, dun, 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 dun. And these people who have a logo that kind of looks like the Death Star have this like really epic rocket ship that's entering into the play. And then Moby's coming in here with this baguette and it's like, dun, dun. And then the result of that fight was called the Open Container Initiative. Right, so this was a big departure from the virtual machine land, which was a pretty fragmented market. Um, lots of value in that market space, but with containers, folks like uh, Brandon Phillips and Solomon Hikes and Jerome Pezzoni and all, all these you know, thought leaders in the space were like, hey, maybe we should try to work together like better so that we don't end up in the same kind of usability pitfalls and lack of interoperability that we have in the virtual machine land. And then nobody really knows what happened to the rocket ship. Like it just kind of flew off somewhere and the people don't really keep track of it. But now Moby has like all of these cool friends and projects and some of them, like basically everyone's like mostly nice to each other sometimes basically. And then this guy is like the nicest human in the entire world. And it's just a real privilege to like be able to sit down and have lunch with them. His name is Phil. And like, he's like coming and joining in the party and he meets with some smart people and they're like, you know, this container thing is really blowing up and maybe it should be like easier to use containers on like all of the different kinds of computers that are important to us, like Raspberry Pis and gateway desktops and IBM Z power mainframes. And um, so then he makes this thing called manifest tool and suddenly we're able to now kind of defragment how people are using container images. And so basically like a lot happened and now everyone wants like all the containers and it should be like super easy and it has to work on all of our computers. Uh, but we have like lots of different kinds of computers, right? There's stuff that runs on Intel chips, there's ARM chips, um, stuff that runs in your phone, the Raspberry Pis, we've got like blade servers, um, you know, there's edge computing, which is super hot these days. And then there's all these operating systems too, because Microsoft is like really cool now and they do a lot of open source stuff and they're a services based company. And then like, of course, all of the Linux hackers are like, Hey, we invented containers. And then like Jesse Brazil's like, no, not really. Um, containers aren't a real thing and they used to be a real thing in other operating systems. But um, yeah, it's kind of complicated. So there's all these platforms. And so how do we get to what Phil was talking about? Well, normally you want, you want to start a container, right? You're going to need an image from somewhere. You could make the image yourself, but usually most people's first contact is like, okay, I'm going to get an image from Docker Hub, which is called the image registry. And so I'm like, hey, can I like start an Ubuntu container and then it, my Docker daemon like reaches out to Docker Hub and it's like, hey, I, I need a Ubuntu at the latest tag. And so Docker Hub's like, hey, like I have an image manifest for that. So an image manifest is a formal OCI compliant type. It has a digest, which is 
you know, usually the form of a hash. And then there's also these layer IDs inside of the manifest. And so Docker Hub's like, hey, I found this for you, sends it back to you, and then you're able to get all of those sweet, sweet layers that then stack on top of each other so that you can create your container. Right, so now you're good, right? You're rolling with Docker, you've got a container, but there's no identification of like what kind of image you need here. And so a lot of people were just tagging, right? Like if you uh, were to go to Docker Hub, and then you look for something like ARM64, you'll see that there's this entire organization of images that are formally built by Docker. Uh, and then there's another one for S390X, there's another one for PowerPC, there's another one for ARMv7 stuff. And you've got like copies of all of these images. Or if you look at some people's private repos, they have like specific tags. Um, so in the Weaveworks Ignite organization, uh, we have a runtime for our hypervisor that is tagged for ARM64 and AMD64, right? So you can get to those specific ones. But then there's this thing, right? There's a list of stuff that seems to support multiple platforms, right? And then when I click that, it, it like takes me to an image. So how does that work? Well, basically two things can happen when you go to a schema v2 compliant registry. You you say, hey, I have this image in this tag. Can you please get me to an image? And a party like Docker Hub will either be like, I've got a manifest or I have a OCI image index. Uh, this is canonically referred to as a manifest list. Right? It's a list of image manifests. And it's not really a list, it's more of a map. <laughs> um, but it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. So it's kind of like a collection of key value pairs. And basically, Docker Hub will return this manifest list back to you. And you're, you're a laptop that's running Docker. Docker is like, oh, I'm running on Linux on an AMD64 machine. Can you, I, I want to work with that manifest from the list. And then you can get back to those sweet layers and you can create your container, right? And um, the specifics of how this works are interesting. Uh, these are formal APIs. They're standardized from that OCI thing that came out from the runtime wars. And you can read about them from these links. I just wanted to give you some resources if you want to look into, hey, what is a descriptor? What, um, what constitutes a proper content ID and what hash algorithms are supported? Uh, and then this manifest li list thing, like what is the API version and how do I build my own tools around that kind of thing? So I'm um, gonna go a little bit unscripted here now and kind of just demonstrate some things, right? So we were looking at Docker Hub. And if you go to like say the official Ubuntu image and you look at the latest tag, right? Here's that manifest list that we're talking about. So you see all these digests for individual images that are all tagged under one thing. Right, it's listing out these individual digests for a bunch of different platforms, right? Platform being a combination of OS architecture and the variant of that architecture, such as ARM v7, right? So if I were to say, um, go to the S390X version of this, which is designed to run on mainframes, right? Then um, I can take this SHA right here and I can do like, uh, I'll just make sure to disable a particular kernel feature here really quick and then we can talk about it. I can I can attempt to run that image. So this is Ubuntu at a very specific manifest tag. That's called the digest there. And so here what we're seeing is, oh, okay, well, I, I was able to address that image Specifically, it's not for my architecture, so I, it got the container and the Linux kernel didn't know what to do with the file. There's an exec format error. But I mean, normally, if I just run the image, it works, right? So something is happening there. Uh, I'm getting a, a different tag, you know, when I ask for a specific version of Ubuntu. 
And that, that digest, uh, that image manifest is specifically for my architecture. Right. But uh, how can we validate that that's true? Well, there's, um, there's some experimental CLI features inside of Docker that I like to have enabled. Um, the ones that we're going to be going over today are the Docker manifest command, as well as Docker build X, not Docker build. Um, so Docker manifest has an inspect command. The manifest subcommand is an extension of SSP's manifest tool, fills, fills stuff. Uh, they eventually were able to work with some peers. Another gal uh, got all of the manifest tool stuff vendored into Docker. Um, so this is now an experimental UX that you can use to be like, okay, well, can you show me a little bit of those details that we were talking about regarding what's inside of that manifest list? I can talk to Docker Hub using the Docker manifest command and see all of the details that are showing up on this web page. So now it's a, in a command line tool, it's real to me, right? Since I'm a developer, I guess. And I can grab these SHAs. And so there's another bit here, which is, well, okay, wouldn't it be kind of useful if I could take that S390X image and actually run it on my, on my machine. I mean, my machine doesn't have the instruction set architecture to actually run that stuff, but maybe I could emulate it somehow. Well, I'd like to talk for a second about how in the world the Linux kernel even executes things. Because uh, there's a real special case. You, you would think normally, okay, well, if I look at something like the, my host's busybox binary, right? It's a uh, elf executable. Right? And um, this is statically linked. So, I mean, the Linux kernel knows how to open this thing up. Most operating systems do, actually. And if I, um, I, I can run it. But what about like a file? like just like a normal text file, right? Maybe I could look at a shell script from one of our projects. I mean, that, that's just ASCII text inside of a, a file. I mean, that, how, how do you execute ASCII text, right? But if you have been using Unixy stuff for a while, you'll know that if you look at the head of a shell script, you'll see this hash bang and then a command line, right? like multiple arguments that are supposed to be get, get executed by something. And what you become familiar with and learn to take for granted is that the Linux kernel, if a file is text and it's marked as executable, then you can execute that file and Linux will read the first line, only the first line, for this, these special characters and then take anything afterwards as an authoritative command line to run. And then it takes the entire file's text and pipes it in to the program. That's pretty weird. It's very useful for shell scripting. And it, there is an entire subsystem, there's a rules engine inside of the Linux kernel that's extensible. So these, this is just built in, but what if I wanted to say, run the Go compiler every time I execute a file that ends in .go? Do you think I could ask the Linux kernel to do that? Or maybe you're crazy, and I'll link to these blog posts from Cloudflare and Jesse Frizzell, uh, but maybe you're crazy and you like to package all of your containers root file systems into a single binary <laughs> um, and then you package Lisp into a binary and install some handler with the Linux kernel so that when you execute Lisp files, they're executed inside of a container. Um, that's, that's pretty weird behavior, but it's possible using a subsystem called bin format. So you can enable that like this. And I'll link to a bunch of resources here uh, from the slides, which will be available. And then <laughs> what if you could install a package um, from apt 
that has a bunch of statically linked binaries that can invoke Kimu for different architectures, right? Well, if I take, I think it's called what, multi-platform? Is there a hyphen in here? Bin format. Nope, not what I'm looking for. Also not what I'm looking for. Sorry, one second, let me find this image. It's called, Kimu user static, multi-arch, that's what it is. So if I run this helper that is maintained by the community that's uh, in this multi-arch org, I can register a bunch of bin format handlers uh, using some very esoteric kernel magic. Um, and basically you can see right here that it sets a bunch of uh, handlers for the particular architecture. So here's that S390X one, and then there's this binary. So let's just make sure that I have that. I have that binary. And this bin format mechanism is managed under the proc file system. So not everything in Linux is a file, but everything in Linux is almost a file. If you look under sysfs and then you go to bin format misc, then there's a bunch of stuff in here. Uh, I can get the status and just make sure that it's enabled for my kernel. That's a magic file. This register binary or um, register pseudo file, if you write to this, you can change what's happening inside of this directory. Everything else is just kind of a mirror of what the Linux kernel is supposed to do. And then you can see here that for this magic string, uh, which matches the header of the file, um, there's an architecture here. It, it, you have to really like read the specs to know this stuff. There's an easier syntax for actually setting this up. And uh, then the interpreter is this Kimu S390X static binary. Right? So now that I have bin format enabled, I should be able to say, go back to that S390X image, right? This is gonna fail. I'm still gonna get that format error because some images come with a bundled, um, some images come with a bundled Kimu emulator inside of them, but this particular one does not. And so I'll need to mount my emulator from the host. So that is gonna be the user bin, Kimu S390X static. And then we'll just put that in the same place inside of the mount namespace of the container. So what this is gonna do now is the container is running from a shared kernel. So when it executes a process inside of the container's uh, mount and pid namespace, it's going to behave the way the kernel is configured to behave. And the kernel's bin format handler is specified to invoke within the mount namespace and pid namespace of the process, uh, this binary, whenever it sees files that are for S390X. And then it takes that file and pipes it into standard in. So this should work. I'm, I'm inside of a container, it looks normal and everything, but what if I run uname? The fun thing here that you can see is that we've got our kernel ID and then we can see that my architecture is S390X. So hopefully uh, if this were an audience that I could receive any feedback from, this is where the clapping would happen. But this is amazing to me. The first time that I tried this out, um, it's, it's, it's like you, you can run any architecture binary from a practical standpoint that you would ever really want to run uh, inside of a container instantly uh, using something from a manifest list. So 
there's even more amazing things. Uh, there's not a lot of hardware that you can buy. Oh, I'll show a failure here really quick. Um, Microsoft has, instead of using the manifest inspect command, I'm using the build X image tools command. There's a little bit of duplicate functionality here. But I'm just going to try and grab the IIS server uh, for Windows and try to run it on my Linux machine. Uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense and it doesn't. Uh, it's not gonna work. But uh, we will try to run one anyway. So, so Lee, I'm just gonna uh, add a little comment here that King Don has uh, has typed in, and he says this is an absolutely incredible demo. Actually, this is information that I tried to understand once on my own and gave up. So, just uh, FYI there. Thank you so much for that feedback. Um, it's you, it's always good to get like direct acknowledgement that like you're helping somebody. I, I just, I really want to be all of your guys' friends. Um, and I, I hope that you're getting a productive uh, learning experience out of this. <laughs> this has certainly been an interesting week uh, trying to learn this thing. So same thing that's happening here. We went through that logic earlier where the Docker daemon is talking to the registry. I just tried to run this image and we could we can see that it's a manifest list right but then docker came back and said there's no matching manifest for linux amd64 inside of the manifest list of entries so basically all of these are meant to actually run on windows and if you try to run them you're going to get another exec uh, format error so let's just check that that actually happens as well so that i'm not completely yeah so uh, here it says it's not an exact format error. It's just this can't even be used. It's probably a file system thing. So, yeah. Um, there are other cool things that you can do. So I'm going to pull up Tonis's, frankly, mind-blowing blog post. Um, we won't get through half of this. But RISC-V is something that you really can't buy a lot of hardware for right now. Most people don't own a RISC-V computer. Um, and Tonis doesn't own one either. But he can develop for RISC-V stuff using all of these emulation techniques, uh, which is exciting. And um, if you can see the use cases, right, because this is going to be a market that's emerging and exploding at some point, right? Um, you would hope that the open nature of RISC-V uh, would promote like hardware, um, hardware vendors and uh, companies who are interested in owning their own architecture um, or their own data center hardware. Uh, a lot of large enterprises are building their own servers and things like that that RISC-V is likely going to be expanding out in the next couple of decades. And you could get in early on this with the developer experience that's provided by this combination of Kimu emulation, bin format support from the Linux kernel, manifest lists, uh, image registries, and Docker, or Podman, or whatever runtime you're, you're working with. So uh, this, he's got a, a shortcut here that is a little bit non-standard for the package of uh, emulation binaries that I'm using. The paths are just a little bit different. So I'll have to modify this a little bit. But basically, I'll just do that same mount, but then I will do it through this risk v64 static binary just uh, mounting that in and then that's debian oh i like pasted a bunch of stuff in here guess we'll skip the hello demo and just go straight to debian hopefully that works yep so that was a debian root file system that was pulled in from a container and uh if i like take that off and then make it interactive, I should drop in. And now if I run like, I'm on a risk V system here, right? I can look at like whatever, oops, 
there's probably an sh binary or something like that. Oh, I don't have file, I guess. Oops. Well, I guess you can't see the file attributes. But yeah, and now I've just hopped out and that container is as good as gone. But uh, you get to you get to play around with new stuff. He's also got this insane demo at the bottom that runs a risk v virtual machine inside of a Docker container. Uh, this is something I can get really excited about. I mean, I'm, I don't know, maybe maybe other people are not so excited about things that don't exist yet, but um, I think, uh, what, what was this called? This was called Pimu Risk V System, I believe. Yeah, this is, it's just incredible what you can do these days. This is, um, oh, what's the terminal and browser used during the demo? Um, I am using pop OS, which is a derivative of Ubuntu. And this is just GNOME terminal right here. Uh, it supports tabbing and colors and things like that. And then my browser is Firefox and I'm using dark reader. Uh, which allows you to not be blinded by this um, on it just has like a dynamic dark theme for all websites so that's really nice and, um, cool uh, so here we see system debooting up and this is inside of a uh, virtual machine that is running on a risk v kernel as well. So previously we were inside of a risk V container um, with a bunch of risk V executables and the kernel that I'm that's on my laptop was configured to constantly launch just in time emulation of each single binary when I was executing it. But the kernel itself is x86. When you try to do weirder stuff like say run Docker from a different kind of architecture on a non-matching architecture kernel. You can imagine that the C group interfaces, IP table stuff, um, and like just namespace creation, it, it gets a little weird. I, I'm not fully educated on why those things don't work seamlessly, um, but it, it's not, I guess it's not super weird to me that like you wouldn't be able to interface with binaries that are built for a different kernel ABI. Um, but that, I mean, that's, there's even just like a bunch of internal kernel interfaces. Needless to say, um, I tried running like an ARM 64 version of Docker D, uh, inside of a Docker and Docker container on my x86 kernel using Kimu emulation. And that does not work. And neither does the risk V stuff for me. Although T Tony's blogs about it, uh, I'm not sure why it doesn't. But if you boot this Fedora machine <laughs> from this like two gigabyte container image, uh, you eventually get to a login where I think uh, the credentials are, oops, it's a bit slow. Root and then the password is risk v, And then I should get to a shell if system D is ready for me. Yep. And then the crazy thing here is that Docker is actually running uh, and using a bunch of hacky stuff that Tonis did. Um, I think I can just, yeah, like start talking to the daemon and ask it if it's ready for things. Yep, there it is. Docker info. So here we can see, I believe we've got, that's actually not correct. I believe this is just a renamed version of C run. And then we've got, oh yeah, Docker version is probably more enlightening. Right here, the OS and Arch are Linux and RISC-V64. This is not an officially supported build. You can see the, the version here is unknown version. Uh, it's totally hacked up, but the multi-stage build that produced this image and this build of Docker and container D and C run that are all kind of being married together um, are available through that blog post that we were just looking at and that is linked in the slides. So, 
the last thing that I will talk about is like how you actually build your own stuff. Uh, because it's it's not the simplest or most uniform or easy thing to do, but it's getting a lot easier. And we've got more tools and more avenues to get there. So the first thing I mentioned was uh, Phil's manifest tool. Uh, this was kind of the original way that you could make a multi-architecture image um, with a manifest list. It's got a great UX uh, that allows you to inspect stuff that's in a registry, similar to what we were doing with Docker Manifest and Docker BuildX image tools inspect. And then it's got a YAML uh, kind of interface for you to specify like, oh, I want this image from this tag to be used for these architectures. And then how do you even get to an image that's built for a particular architecture? There's two avenues. So one is uh, I was just inside of a RISC-V virtual machine and I had Docker working so I could just build an image from inside of a virtual machine uh, or actual machine that matches that architecture. I could log into a Raspberry Pi, I could create a um, EC2 instance that has ARM64 support and build an ARCH64 image and push that up to Docker Hub and then create a manifest list that shoves it next to my AMD64 image or whatever. Um, but then you can also do emulation for that uh, using the same exploit of bin format. So that's kind of the other half of this. I'm going to go into our Ignite repository and just take a look at our make file to kind of demonstrate to you how this happens. So the Docker file for the Ignite runtime, um, it copies in an emulator into user bin for the build. And then since the kernel is configured for bin format support and the uh, emulator is available inside of user bin, inside of the base image that's being used for the build, you'll, you might know that Docker creates containers during its build process. So during that build process, you can actually execute uh, ARM, ARM binaries and uh, you can do cross, cross compilation that way. Um, so I could start from a Golang ARM64 image, right, and then just build an ARM64 image using the Go ARM64 um, tool chain. Uh, or I could do cross compilation and then copy it into a layer uh, using a multi-stage build. So, and then that stuff is getting easier to do if you look at the documentation for build. Uh, there are some experimental features and variables that are now available. Um, so there are automatic platform args in the global scope. This is from the Docker documentation. And you can see that there is a distinction between what the architecture and platform that you're targeting. So that's OS Arch variant and then the build uh, that is currently occurring. So what's the host architecture and then what's, what are you targeting? So I could be building on AMD 64 and then targeting ARM 64 or something like that. And, um, and there are some, I, yeah, unfortunately, you know, we just don't have time to get into examples and demos of, of all of this, but I have a resources slide that you guys uh, will be able to get to. So here's like all the dark magic spells that are used for the bin format stuff. If you wanna learn deeply about these, um, these mechanisms or maybe become more inspired by the unholy things that are possible that other people have blogged about. Um, there's, you know, set up like how you can get BuildX running even if you're on a Linux host. The cool thing about BuildX is that uh, it already ships in Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. So if you're using a Windows or Mac machine uh, with the Docker virtual machine, the bin format support is already installed and you can use BuildX to start um, like building multiple images for different art platforms <laughs> and then push those up to a registry 
with like a super easy UX. And there's a blog post right here from the Docker engineering blog uh, about how to do that. And then there's also some uh, guidance on how to use that Docker manifest CLI to assemble and inspect manifest lists, as well as a link to Tonis's blog about all of that risk V dark magic. Um, if you want to play around with an instruction, uh, instruction set architecture that doesn't have readily available hardware yet, but what I and many other hackers think is a very open and promising way forward uh, to new hardware and, uh, and more open computing. I mean, if one day Intel dies and we, we don't get to see all of the secret stuff, we'll have risk V, right? So, and um, a little bit about that schema V2.2, um, like manifest list thing. Most registries these days are now implementing really good support for it. Uh, there can be some problems with the tooling that we have. So for instance, uh, I was trying to use the Docker manifest command uh, with Kubernetes images. Um, if you don't know uh, the way that we actually distribute inspect Kate's, if you look at like Kube API server for the most recent release of Kubernetes, uh, yeah, this is exactly the problem. I was trying to do this and I was getting this authentication error. Right, so instead I can just use the build x command. Uh, for some reason this works. It, it's probably a daemon registry authentication thing and the auth helper with the gcloud command line tool. And um, so you can see here that like we distribute kube API server from GCR uh, with a manifest list. And this is why you can run kubeidm on a Raspberry Pi or a zpower mainframe and the images will resolve and run some version of kube API server that's properly compiled for that architecture, right? Just a little Go program that manages your control planes API. Um, Microsoft obviously has like a, a huge interest in making sure that manifest lists are supported. Quay.io, they're working on it. Uh, they've been active in some GitHub issues. Uh, apparently some namespaces have it enabled, but they just never finished the global rollout. Um, so some people are still reporting issues using manifest lists on the public service. But Red Hat did announce that if you are running Quay 3 uh, on-prem, then you've got support. So that's a, as far as like, hey, can I actually use this with my enterprise registry or whatever I'm using right now? The answer is probably. So uh, if not, you can just keep tagging uh, with separate tags. So like latest ARM64 you know, or V2 S390X or whatever. And then, uh, yeah, I linked to these design docs. We talked about those earlier. And those are all of the resources that are kind of available. Um, so I, I think it, it's probably, probably good to, to close on that, on that note. Uh, hopefully, just kind of learning about the history of like how we ended up here and why it's important that registries have this mechanism for multiple machines of different platforms to be able to resolve to an image that does the same thing um, is a good thing for UX and helps the, the market ultimately stay valuable because it's not fragmented. Uh, and then uh, we learned a little bit about bin format and the magic that the Linux kernel has available for us when combined with things like Kimu emulation for different architectures. Uh, chatted a little bit about RISC-V and open architectures uh, and governance for hardware and CPUs and things like that. Um, there's also a bunch of work happening in the like open boot world. And then, um, yeah, how do you build your own stuff? We touched a little bit on that and there's a bunch of links here. So, yeah, awesome. I, am, I am open for questions. <laughs> cool, thank you, Lee. Uh, while you guys uh, type in your questions, if anyone has any questions, just put them into the chat there and I will go ahead and share our closing slides. Uh, so let me know, Lee, if you can let me know if you can see these. Um, yeah, I can see. Okay, great. You've successfully uh, used yeah. presentation. Yeah, if, if you can monitor chat, because I can't see it while I'm presenting, unfortunately. Um, sure and then if any, if any questions come up, please just type them in and then we'll, we'll address them. But, uh, you know, in closing here, uh, 
as Tomo mentioned in the beginning, if this is your first time here, welcome. Uh, this is the Weave Online User Group. We have great speakers like Lee from our WeaveWorks team and some guest speakers uh, coming up. And we're running these sessions, like she said, on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, some of the upcoming talks for the rest of the year are listed here. We got Brett Fisher talking Swarm Kubernetes. Uh, Justin Garrison is going to give us some insight into the Disney Plus launch that's going down right now. Um, and then Dave Aronchik with My Microsoft will be speaking um, on our last WOOG of the year, which is about NLOps uh, using GitOps. So um, yeah, we'd love for you guys to, to check those out. Um, if you have any questions, you can email Tomo, uh, get in touch with us on Slack. Our Slack is here. Um, and we offer this practical guide to GitOps ebook, which you'll get in a follow-up email as well as uh, the resources in the slides from Lee um, and the recording link uh, for everything that's happening or for, for this video today. Um, and then the if you haven't already joined join the Weave user group um, at Meetup, our Meetup page. It's the single source of truth for this calendar. So if you like this session, uh, you can have uh, other sessions that are that are similar to this that uh, that you can have access to. So I see some questions coming in, Lee. Do you want to do you want to take those? Yeah, um, Kingdon asked another very enlightening question, which is: Is there a kind of way to publish an image that has support for multiple architectures, or should multi-arch support? usually or always be done by providing different images for different architectures. I would say the last bit of your question is correct, uh, which is that you should, you should probably build different images um, and tag them in the manifest list for those specific things. Uh, the more formal your CI is for this, so Docker is a good model to follow, and then the build x command makes this really easy to do because there's a platform flag when you do docker build x, and then build X will hook up to a builder backend that has support for your, the different architectures that you have. You can even like use it to build on multiple nodes, but you can just say, take this Docker file, which has all of these target platforms. So just a single Docker file that has the build host and the target platform parameterized. And then you say build X platform, every single thing that I want, and you'll end up with a single kind of bundle of artifacts at the end that you can push up to a registry. Um, so that's like the good way to do it. That's like kind of blessed, but experimental. Um, the first part of your question is more interesting to me, which is, is there a kind of way to publish an image that has support for multiple architectures? And um, the first thing is, if you have an image with no entry point, then somebody else, uh, sorry, if you're building from a base image which supports multiple arcs, does that mean you need separate base images for each arch? Um, yes, but the base image will also benefit from the fact that you can, so the, the question is if you are building from a base image and you're supporting multiple architectures, do you need to use different base images? And it's kind of yes, like in practice, because things should be split up per architecture, but then represented all together in a manifest list, you'll have a separate digest and a separate image manifest uh, being used as a base image for each of your architectures if you're splitting your image build out like that. And, um, but it's like you can parameterize the image that you're using in that single Docker file, either using an environment variable, or you can use the fact that your target host will automatically resolve the image that it needs from a manifest list, right? So I can say like from Ubuntu latest, and if that Docker, Im if that Docker file is built on an, a Raspberry Pi, then the base image that's used will automatically be ARM64. But then if I build that on, on a mainframe, then it's you know, different. But yeah, could you make an image that supports multiple uh, kinds of architectures? There's nothing stopping you from having files uh, that are meant to be run on different kinds of computers in the same root file system, right? So you could distribute all of that stuff in the same root FS if you want, and then somebody could either invoke it uh, using like a command 
or an environment variable that's passed to a shell script. Uh, the reason why I found that interesting is because a text file is platform agnostic. And remember that every Linux kernel ever can execute a text file uh, and using the shebang support. So you could have a generic text file that does some trickery to invoke different architectures depending on some user behavior, uh, which would be weird, very weird. So you could probably inspect uh, like the proc file system to figure out what architecture you're on uh, from a bash script and then invoke the proper binary with exec to replace your process. So <laughs> I, I didn't know that before. So thank you for asking the question because now we have an answer. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks Lee for the presentation and thanks everybody for joining. We'll, uh, we'll see you guys next time. It doesn't look like there's any more questions. So we'll close it down.